that there are three ways that people use data. Some use it for good, some use it for bad, and some uses are kind of neither here nor there. They don't really make the world a better place, but on aggregate, they're probably not harming that many people. It's just a really good sink of resources, money, skills, capacity, people. So a good use would be something that does make the world a better place, something that addresses poverty, something that looks at equality, something that manages diseases, manages natural disasters. Something bad would be using data for terrorism or snooping on people's private lives. And the rest? It's this kind of stuff. It's the noise. We spend almost six years in total of our life on social media. 40 minutes a day on YouTube, 35 minutes a day on Facebook, 25 minutes a day on Snapchat. Baffling, given the fact it breaks down the world into a few second tranches. But it's not just social media, it's this constant noise of our daily lives. It's thought the people aged between 18 and 45 have 80% of their waking lives captured in some way digitally. It could be the text you send, the things you use with your bank. It could be the music you listen to. It could be your travel card if it's digital. I'm a researcher in London at UCL working with Spiros and Axas and Martin Rosser. And my research looks at lots of these routinely collected data sets to see if we can use them for good, to see if we can use them to fight diseases, and more specifically, to see if we can use them to predict and then ultimately prevent dementia. So we've already talked about the fact that we're all going to be living for longer. Everyone in this room will be living till at least 100, which means that, given the rate at which science is going now with dementia, at least half of us will die with this condition. 850,000 people in the UK currently have dementia. And it's a really harrowing disease. I'm sure many people in this room have grandparents who have it. It's not just harrowing for the people who have it, but it's also for their families. It's a condition that, as you get older, you start to lose your cognitive function. You start to forget things. Your personality can change. You become agitated, you become aggressive. It can manifest in lots and lots of different ways. But the problem with dementia, which is not dissimilar to a number of conditions, is your brain starts to deteriorate long before you actually start to see symptoms. And it's not like breaking your leg or having a virus. Losing your cognition fundamentally chips away at the human condition. To be a thinking, sentient, conscious human being, that's what makes you, you, and me, me. But what, what even is cognition? You can't hold it. It's quite difficult to count it. It's almost a philosophical question, what is cognition? And how on earth can we start to improve something we can't really even measure? So, We've got this problem here. We've got a disease we don't have a cure from. And we've also got this constant live feed, this data flow, this data fingerprint of our lives. So how can we marry the two up? How can we use a digital fingerprint to fight disease? How can we build a digital fingerprint of cognition? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of a few methods that some data scientists use. They're not the flashiest, but we've already talked a bit about machine learning. This is to give you an idea of some of the tools, some of the approaches, some of the creative ways we can start to completely rethink disease through some of these data sets that basically have nothing to do with disease. So the first one is something called classification. And basically what a classification method does is it distinguishes between healthy and sick people based on some known markers. So I've chosen some random markers here. So this is not my research. This is a slightly reduced form to give an example. So let's say the distance you travel from your home, something called your radius of movement. And there's some ideas that actually your radius of movement does give you a sign about your mental health. And then let's say on the x-axis is the number of friends you text, the breadth of your social network. So we get a bunch of people together, and we plot them on this graph. And so people down in the bottom quadrant here they don't move very far from home, and they don't text many people. And the sort of tan-colored, orange, yellow, not helpful color for a presentation, they sit at the top, top right-hand corner, and they're the people who are very gregarious. They, they text lots of people, and they move far away. So, in this example, the blue brains are people who we know have dementia, and the tan brains are people who currently don't have dementia. 
And this is the bit where the algorithm comes in. An algorithm is a rule, a set of instructions. And the algorithm goes away and says, how can we best break this data set up to differentiate between sick and healthy people? So the algorithm does this and basically says, those people in the red box, high risk of dementia. Yeah, go figure. We can see that most people in that box do have dementia. The blue brains do. Yeah, we missed one person. We included someone else by accident. That's a kind of appropriate classification error. But the algorithm's done quite a good job of distinguishing between sick and healthy people. Now, this in itself isn't immensely valuable, but then we've got a new person coming in, our yellow brain. We don't know if this person's going to get dementia or not, but we do know how far they travel from home regularly, and we do know how many friends they text. And so we can predict that actually, given those two markers, they're quite a high risk of dementia. A second example is something called clustering. So this is similar in some ways to classification and different in others. The difference between classification and the example I gave in clustering is a classification you knew what the moving parts were, you knew the markers, the distance from home, the number of friends you text, the people who have dementia. Clustering in this example allows you to find new markers, these things that you actually have no idea. They could be associated with the disease, they could not be. So I've, again, plucked out two random potential markers. Here is how anxious we all are, something that could be collected on, a, on an app, for example, and then the actual time you spend on your phone, which all your, which all your phones collect. So this time we plot a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of brains on this graph. This time they all have dementia. And we write an algorithm. This is something called an unsupervised learning algorithm. And we say, find us the groups, cluster people together, cluster people into similar groups so they are, are next to people who are like them. So the algorithm works away and comes back with these four groups. Now, obviously, in this example, we could have all seen that ourselves. Imagine if this is across millions, if not billions, of data points. So we've got four groups here. Why is that valuable? Well, it's valuable because then you go into those groups and you say, why have they been pushed together? Is it that the blue group, everyone has black hair? They all send over 500 Snapchats a day. Do they have a particular blood pressure? Do they have a particular medical history? And you'll start to realize that groups have similar things in common. And that's useful because when you look at a disease, you can't just look at dementia. It's a massive disease, super heterogeneous. This allows you to A, uncover new markers, the hair color, the family history, the number of Snapchats they send a day, but also allows you to break apart a disease into small bits, allows you to be more specific in your interventions, allows you to think about redefining diseases. The third and final example of a kind of method and a kind of creative approach we can use to find new cures for disease is something called pattern mining. So think of this as like the Amazon shopping cart, but for dementia. So when you're on Amazon, you buy something. So the other day, I bought face paint and stencils because I was going to a fancy dress party. And Amazon said, you know what, Maxine? You look like someone who needs a leopard print leotard. And I was like, you know what, I really do, I really do. So I bought my leopard print leotard. Imagine if we did this approach, but for dementia. So imagine all these different pathways of different shopping carts, different journeys people go through. And let's take an example of how often you go and see your doctor. So our friend in the, in the green path here sees their doctor seven times, and then the brain is the point at which they get a diagnosis. So let's say they have a prescription infection scan scan, prescription infection scan. It's not necessarily the value of those appointments or the values you get from those results, but it's just the fact that they had that pattern. So imagine if we did this over millions and millions of different patients. We realize that actually, maybe in a given time, prescription infection scan scan, prescription infection scan is a really common pattern that people who ultimately get dementia have. So it means the next time someone has prescription infection scan scan, you can say, whoa, I know what the next thing here is. It's prescription but then I know that later on, it's ultimately going to be dementia. So that means that we can start to intervene early and push the diagnosis, saving potentially years, which could be the difference between someone having a curative therapy or being beyond help. So we can push all of these data sets together. We can create this smorgasbord of random data sets. They can be with what you watch on YouTube. They can be what's in your medical record. You could be what you spend your money on in your bank. It could be what you Google, what's on your Facebook. There are some problems with, with putting all these data together. But on the surface of it, a lot of these have basically nothing to do with health. But this allows us to uncover new markers, new markers of any disease. The threshold of those markers, we think about new ways of classifying diseases, it allows us to create subgroups of patients and in turn, create subgroups of diseases. 
Our hierarchies of diseases are false. Diseases are not big, one, amorphous blobs. They're made up of lots and lots of different moving parts. And also how diseases evolve over time. On one day, you're not a dementia patient. The next day, you are. That's not the reality of how diseases kick in. But also, quite importantly, why are these tan brains always super healthy? What is it that makes them resilient? So in turn, we can create a fingerprint, a digital fingerprint of cognition that goes from sick to healthy. It's like a risk score for your life. So how can this be actioned? Well, we take our friend here who's unfortunately got a blue fingerprint, which means high risk in our example. Currently a young person, currently perfect cognition, super fit and healthy, 100% them. But because we know that they're a blue fingerprint, we know that this is their trajectory of decline. We know they're going to get dementia. We know they're going to get anxious. We know that they're going to start to forget things. So in the future, when we have a cure, when we have an intervention, we could intervene there, a poster in the red zone, which means that person's cognition remains happy and healthy and perfect for longer. So have a think about what your data, or even your metadata, says about you. Think about a life event you've had. It could be dramatic, it could have been gradual. How might have that been picked up in your data sets, these seemingly boring, seemingly routinely collected data sets? And think about the organizations that have that data. Are they using it for good? Are they using it at all for value? And if not, why? But if they are, are they using it ethically? And how can you champion, how can you advocate the better use of your data for things that really matter? Because that could be the difference between someone's life being lost or being saved. So when you're next sitting at the end of the kitchen table, posting your 15th Instagram photo of the day, and like all of us have had our parents say, come on, look up, engage in conversation, get off your phone. You can say, mom, dad, don't interrupt. I'm generating data. And data saves lives. Thank you.